I'm going to confess this to you, my friend. Okay. Um, my wife of 10 years, almost 10 years, <laughs> had up until last night never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you look at me and say, I've never seen it either. Oh, <gasps> no, I've seen it. I'm just, I'm just really. Try not to be judgmental. I don't know. Yeah, man, it's hard, bro. You know, COVID happened and I'm a bit like. I, I, there's I no excuse. <laughs> to watch every movie that's ever existed. You, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's no excuse. Even the, yeah, there is no, there is no excuse. What's so funny is is she, my wife, literally fell asleep in the theater during Transformers. Just what out? If there's explosions, wow. action, it is like a wet, just warm, warm blanket, and just throw it on her. She's like, "Good night, everybody." <laughs> it is the funniest thing. But she loves like Air Force One. To her, is just one of the best action movies ever. I'm like. Okay, I was like, you need to understand where that guy came from. So I, just, I was like, you need to okay. see Raiders of the Lost Ark. We had to break it up into two sessions. And we get up to the big, you know, brawling thing on the, on the wing. And then she was like wrapped with attention. The only time she's never like, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sleeping pill. We were in Paris for Christmas. And I had this whole scheme. I found the, the last saddest Charlie Brown Christmas tree that you could find in Paris. Because it was Christmas Eve. We're like, what do you mean you want to try to buy a Christmas tree right now? And I, I found a Christmas tree and I had stashed it in the side of the hotel room that she would never see, like in a closet. And I was like, she's going to go to sleep at like 930. And I'm going to wait and I'm going to wait till she goes to sleep. And I'm going to decorate the entire room. Right. And I was like, I know what we'll do. I was like, you've never seen Mission Impossible. She's like, no. I was like, oh, let's watch Mission Impossible. You'll be out in seven minutes. And that bitch stayed awake for the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like goddamn midnight. I'm like, could you please go to bed? Um, you ain't cracked her, man. She's on it. <laughs> no. So that was a big setup to say that we we had we were plowing through um, a wonderful show that you're on, Raised by Wolves. And what's so funny is is that the original Travis Fimmel were huge fans of Vikings. We got to do uh, a, a convention, spent two weeks with Travis down in Australia. And he's just a wonderful, wonderful person. I don't know if you've even worked with him. Don't spoil anything yet because I'm on episode four now, which you had a okay. You have a wonderful arc in that show. And then I look, I was like, it's, it's, where yeah, do I so know much this fun. dude? Where do I know this dude? Where did I look? I was like, son of a bitch. That's who it is. We have met, I use rabbit ears, because we were on a, first of all, I played uh, Assassin's Creed Origins and I was like, this guy's really, really good. And I went back and forth too. Uh, I'm going to let you talk in a second. Just let me fawn over you and just set the <laughs> stage. You're the fucking guest. And I'm just like, it's like, this guy didn't shut up. I, I play right. Assassin's Creed Origins. And, uh, and I was like, this guy's really, really good. And I have this love-hate relationship with Assassin's Creed where it's like, it, I feel like right. it's the girlfriend that you dated after a breakup. And whenever things kind of go south, you just call her up and like, I know this is going to go, but just, do you want to come over? Oh. We'll just hang out and maybe, I don't know, maybe... And that's, that's oh, my relationship. Wow. And after she leaves, you're like, gosh, I should never fucking call her again. But then you end up calling <laughs> her again. So that's my relationship with Assassin's Creed. And what's so funny is that Origins and Valhalla have been like, okay, maybe maybe we could date. <laughs> and and then you and I are on a BAFTA um, uh, panel. Well, no, not, not a panel. Yes. But like we're part of the judges, judges panel. Yeah. And I was like, this dude is charismatic. And I'm always like a little hesitant about people from TV or, or film that come in and do games. And then, and then you show up and I'm like, oh, this motherfucker loves games. And you started your own studio. Yeah, man. I've, yeah, I'm like, I'm like serious loving. Like, I'm like, I was gonna, like, as I, like look, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, you've, you've, We've, we've, you say that, you know, we've met at the BAFTA panel, my friend, we have grown up together. The amount of games that I've played with your voice in, my friend, is ridiculous. <laughs> like, let, let me just, let me just, like, lay the, like, I, I know you, Troy, more than you probably know yourself, Shit. my dear friend. Like, seriously, man, like, I am, I'm such a, I'm such a, as I said, like, I'm such a fan of your work. 
and I'm such a fan of like the games industry as a whole and mm. like the stories that you have been a part of and told like yeah man it's 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 my lifeblood like it's it's truly my my fuel and I love I love games and so where did this come from like where did you, I mean you grew up in London right where where'd you grow up yeah well I grew up just outside of London and um I grew up in like a small a small little um like countryside um with uh like only child of my my mum and dad and um basically you know the cinema and like wasn't really a thing that we would that we could do uh tv uh, I didn't really I didn't really connect with it um books I'm dyslexic so it took me a long time to kind of read so my dad instead of like you know <laughs> saying like go outside and play football or do something or whatever he actually he bought me like you know a mega drive and and oh, i ended up just literally losing myself in these in these worlds and then you know things kind of escalated got to the playstation one playstation two and the, you know the stories began really kind of hitting me as a kid and i remember thinking to myself these are the stories these are moving me this is all moving me this is the kind of story that these are the worlds in which i'm actually I'm taking control of a character and I'm going on a journey with them, a personal journey, man. Like I'm evolving with them. And that was where the love for it came from. It's this love for being able to tell these stories, interactive experiences, right? And like again, like it's it's it was it was so it was so right at the time for me, simply because again, I I mean, like again, like films, like yeah, they move, like they do move me and they and I and I do, you know, I do enjoy watching films and I do enjoy watching TV, but there's something about games and there's something about spending, you know, multiple like weeks yeah. with a character rather than necessarily, you know, sitting down and binge watching, you know, Game of Thrones and, and you're done in like eight hours or whatever. Like with games, it's like, you know, you can spend 30, 40, 50, 200 hours and still feel like I'm part of that world. And that's that to me was what really just really clicked. And like, honestly, like I, I did the whole, you know, uh, classical training of drama school, like did a bit of theater here and there, did a bit of film and TV or whatever. But to me, games, that's, that's where the that's where home is, man. And as I said, man, you have, you have really shaped that world for me. And I've, I, it's, it's crazy. Like actually, even now talking to you now, like it's, <laughs> it's weird, right? It's, it's so weird. Cause <laughs> And I generally, but the thing is, it's like, you know, I, and I always say this, like the first time I ever went to, um, to an event where it was predominantly game industry people was, was the BAFTAs. And like, you know, I've, I've met like, you know, I've seen like people like Jim Carrey or whatever, like yeah. in the flesh and whatever. And it's, it's just, isn't the same. I lose myself. I, 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 I freaked out when I met Doug Cockle from The Witcher, man. Yeah, dude. Like, was, you know what I mean? Like, I freaked he's out just at him. meek, meager dude. Like, really love <laughs> like, 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 do you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, and it's, it's, it's just something that, like, that, that world, that, that, that place of storytelling is, it just, it just meant so much to me that I just wanted to, it's the area that I wanted to give back the most and yeah so I've started this studio in in lockdown and decided you know what I want to start telling these stories I want to move someone like me uh in the same way that I felt moved back then and kind of show and show and connect to to wider audiences in that regard because it is powerful it's a powerful storytelling medium I mean like like I grew up I didn't grow up in a in a nice area my life could have gone a completely different way but it's because of games in, and because of that world and because of the storytelling, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Now imagine like that, and I genuinely put it down to it, genuinely has saved my life in so many instances and so many times. Imagine what, you know, what that could do. Like it should, it should be done more. So rather than seeing as something like that is bad or that is something like, um, it, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's antisocial. It's not antisocial at all. Mm. To me, oh, yeah. it's been well, one, of the, one of the most common ground connecting that that term life saving is is often used not because of uh, it's not just a term of convenience. It's an apt term. There have been people who are like the, the reason why I like playing games and the reason why I was drawn to games is because similar to you, just, but 
same song, different tempo, right? Or same mm. same song, different genre. I I grew up and no matter what I did physically to to apply myself, it it typically resulted in shame, fear, <laughs> or injury. And I I just I wasn't physically adept. So the same thing, like I, I didn't have my picture. My my parents, you know, go go outside and, and do this. I didn't play sports growing up. Um, even though I this is, I, I might want to, and I've been, I don't know if you've done this too. You like, you like start repacking or unpacking it and, and relitigating your child. I don't know how old you are. How old are you? I'm 28. Fuck, you're young. Megan, <laughs> dude, you, you got that. Um, I, so I've, I've got some years on you, my brother, but I, I've started repacking it and, and now I'm a dad. And so I'm, I'm going back and I'm looking and, and I'm kind of like replaying the, the movie of my, of my life and looking and going, I, I grew up thinking this and didn't really <clears throat> understand the true currency of which, uh, what I was trading in. And I, I accepted a narrative by my parents. I'm not demonizing, vilifying my parents, but I think I, I finally come to the point in my life where I can say my parents were doing the best they could. They were fucking right. young when they became parents. They were 21 <clears throat> when they got married, wow. 22 when they had my sister, and 24 when they had me. So that's young. Oh, wow. I am, dude, you're 28. The the It's almost like in dog years, your 20s. You just kind of go, wha-bam, and you just kind of like start having this <laughs> exponential growth. When you hit 30, everything just kind of slows down for a second. You're like, okay, I need to stop drinking as much as I was. I need more than 30 minutes of sleep a night. <laughs> and I might want to think about a career. <laughs> and then your 40s, you're like, oh, those guys are so fucking stupid. And then <laughs> you get to your 40s. So I, here, here I am. And one of the reasons why I love it, I, I, it's driving me crazy. There was a line from last night's episode. Um, but I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but you had this very, very poignant line. And, and the writing, especially for father, is exquisite, man. It, it really is um there there's this if you haven't been watching raised by wolves you should because it's not a show that you expect it to be um i expected this space opera um super sci-fi which just mm, for me because i grew up on sci-fi i grew up on the bad 70s uh shows and movies i grew up uh watching you know TOS and TNG when it was when it was airing, you know, Thursday night or Friday night when it came out. So like I I remember growing up with with sci-fi. I, I read Gene Roddenberry. I read Isaac Asimov. I read Robert Heinlein. Like I I was a sci-fi kid. That there were people that were like, here's your two paths. You can either go fantasy or sci-fi. What do you want to do? You're a nerd. Pick. And I was like, I don't know. I guess sci-fi. <laughs> I was like, where are the other? There's no girls there, by the way. All the girls are going to fantasy. So you missed the boat on that. I hope you can make friends or be gay because that's going to work out great for you. So I, I I start watching this show and I'm like, okay. And I'm judging it. You know, I'm like, all right. Meh, 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 meh. And then there's the big reveal with mother but father just has this you have a challenge in front of you right and i don't know if you watched did you watch star trek next generation at all like like yeah 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 there's a temptation and i've had to do this in a couple roles where you're like data becomes the print it's no longer c3po was the print for for android it mm. was data and you don't want to do this very high my name is this but at the same time you can't deny the fact you're an android that is your conflict is that you are not human put in the human condition and and yeah. the pinnacle of that as a father and the love that you show especially for campion is just is is exquisite but there was there was a line last night and man it like affected me the stuff that normally wouldn't affect me started to once I, i've got a boy he's two and a half he's fucking awesome he's a genius but there's the whole scene where you're like you're gonna kill this thing because i need you to do the hard thing because otherwise we're not going to be here. And you're, you're the campy is probably nine or eight or nine. I don't know how old he's in the school. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. around there, right? And you're teaching this kid, you're like, you are on a foreign planet. You're in a hostile environment. And mom and dad aren't going to be here. And it, it is breaking my heart, but I need you to do the hard thing because I need to know that if I'm gone, you're going to be okay. And I can't remember the line. Campion says something about death. He goes, death is final. And you said something about, 
all things are final, but it's when you're standing at the shed and you have this moment, it's driving me crazy. I'm going to like rewatch the episode because it was such a poignant line. And the performance that you gave in it was, was so beautiful because I genuinely felt like you as the actor had rehearsed your lines and you had moved the blocking and you understood where camera was going to be and you hit your marks and everything. And you say this line and in the moment, it, it transforms from a line of dialogue into a truth as it is coming out of your mouth and you react to yourself saying it. And I was like, that is, that's what every actor wants to find is a moment where the script becomes alive for them. And the, the camera yeah. just happens to capture it. Like Marlon Brando did flawlessly and effortlessly. We stumble into that and was like, did anybody catch that? Cause I just did something that was amazing. What has what this transformation been for you? And when you get the size, when you get the breakdown, you get this opportunity, hmm. you're going to do this show. What's it called? We can't tell you. What's it about? We can't tell you. What's the character? We can't tell you. Because that's the nature of the audition thing. But let me see what you do with this. What was it about this thing that drew you? What Was it just the exigencies of the artist situation being of the financial? And you're like, I got bills I got to pay. And these people are going to give me a nickel no, to do man. this. It, like, I think, again, you know, coming from that sci-fi perspective, like, I'm a, I am a sci-fi, I'm a massive sci-fi nerd. And I remember reading the script and thinking to myself, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never read anything like this before. And there is a humanity but a, 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 a sort of um, android -y nature to father that was so potent and powerful. The fact that it's the simplicity of just trying to be a good father. And I remember, like, my dad, like, he passed away, like, and I remember he's, he's one of the, the best, he's, like, one of the best human beings I've, I will ever meet, hands down, in my life. Like, there's genuinely... It was no bad bone in the body. This man was selfless. And I remember the impact he had on me. And to be able to try and connect to something like that, to be able to try and, it's, it's just, there was just something magical about that, you know, about, I was handed this character who just wants to be a good father, knowing that I've had a good father who really cared, you know, I was fortunate to have a good father who really loved me and really cared for me that I really felt for. And to be able to try and put something in, like there was, it was just, I don't know, it, it was almost like a, like a gift. And I genuinely remember reading the script and thinking sci-fi, but dealing with family, dealing with the idea of survival, dealing with something that I've never seen before. Like this is, this is, this is magic, man. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, you know, the writer himself, Aaron Gozikowski, like, you know, he did Prisoners, right? And Prisoners is so different to this. Yeah. Like, but when you talk to him and, you know, you see how much love he's put into this, it, and like the care, you know, and him drawing from his experiences of being a parent, of being, you know, and learning from that and then putting it into this piece of piece of art, man. Like, like it was almost like to the point where I, if if this was if this was a theater piece or something that, you know, was that a, a, a mate came over and, and handed me this piece and was like, yo, we need to do this for free or something. <laughs> I, it's just like I do it, man. Like it's it was so powerful. Like it was. It just moved me. There was a moment where I genuinely, like I completely, I doubted the fact that I got this piece and I was thinking, I can't do this. This is too good. And then you see someone's name like Ridley Scott on it and you're just like, no, hell no. He wants like Fassbender or Pale. If he wants to go black, go Boyega. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, what? Like, but it was, I, it just, it just spoke to me, man. It really spoke to me and it really was, it was almost like just thinking to myself, like, okay, being a dad, being a good father, if I could capture even an essence of what, or, or try and replicate what my dad almost brought to me or taught me to be the, you know, to, to be the man that I am today, like in this, in this character, if I can almost, um, you know, uh, immortalize him in this character, then I, then I'm, you know, yeah. What a beautiful sentiment. How how old if you don't mind, how old were you when your when your dad passed? I was 20. So yeah. bro, this was, this this is not that long ago. No, man. And it was and it was and it was one of those moments where it was like it was the first time, first time I realized that your parents aren't immortal. 
your parents aren't gods, right? The, 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 it was also the, re- the time I realized as well, like, because I had in this my head, like, I think, and I think it's, it's natural, right? You have this idea, especially of like growing up maybe and, and, you know, you having your kids and then your parents becoming grandparents and that kind of vibe, like that's the natural progression of things. And my dad, I remember, <laughs> I remember, you know, my dad is the last person I ever thought who was going to, who was going to pass away. And it happened so suddenly and so quickly. It, it, it really made me, it just, it just shook me and it really woke me up. And I remember for a good year or two afterwards, and it, it really was, it was just a very, very weird and dark period. Um, but at the same time, all the things that he taught me, that kept me on a fucking straight line. And it really made me the man that I am today. Like I, just, like, I cannot tell you how much of an impact this man had on me. Hmm. And like, I love my mom. Like I, I adore her, but my mom, my mom's crazy, man. <laughs> so I, it's I like, it. do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's, and it's, and, but it's like, you know, there was something about the things that my dad taught me before he passed that has, and I still am learning, you know, and I'm still this, there's still this knowledge that he's given me and, and bestowed it upon me that I remember thinking, God, yeah, that's a good point. Even if it's like something as stupid as bloody tax or saving money or whatever. Like the point is, is that he had such an impact on me that to be able to be given the chance to like immortalize him again, as I say, like in this show, in this production as a father, like it yeah, was like, man. I'm taking this. The, the beauty of it is, is what I hear already. I hope you feel a sense of accomplishment that you have. First of all, the, the impact that we have, man, I, I've, I've been people that listen to me or watch this or whatever, really might get tired of me hearing, but you just deal with it. Cause I, I've been going down this stoic um, path. I won't even say rabbit hole because rabbits don't dig holes. They dig warrens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a misnomer. The level of stoicism, because I, 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 I worked so hard to prove things and I realized what I was doing is I was trying to prove them to other people, but really I was trying to prove it to myself. And right. all of the things that I, I, I had set for myself as goals Either I hit them and found the emptiness and the vacancy on the other side of it, or I realized that they weren't goals that I wanted to have in the first place. I was doing it for some other reason, or I was never going to be able to hit those goals. And so I start looking, and I'm like, and then death just was a, uh, my, my buddy, you know, Austin Wintry, right? Composer well, I've, I mean, I've heard, yeah, I've yeah, yeah, heard yeah, his yeah. music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I would love for you guys to have a conversation. Um, I, I have... My closest friends, it, it feels like, have uh, have had this um, the same theme of loss of father. Austin lost his dad um, about t- ten years ago, twelve years ago. Um, my friend Travis Willingham, which you know, um, lost his father when he was fourteen. Um, so wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he th- th- there's this this notion of loss of father. My relationship with my father is is strained to say the least. Um, mm. So there's a loss of father on my side too. So it's this, and maybe that's what I was drawn to your character on the show as well, besides your stellar performance. But you, what I hear from you is, and I, I see the desire of of you're not a father, right? You're not a dad. No, good. No. Twenty eight. Don't slow down. <laughs> Have fun. Do it recreationally, not vocationally, right now. <laughs> Um, shit changes, man. And I, there's this notion of, of, and I'm sure your dad felt this way of you always hear like, I would die for them. And that's just this wonderful line of script that you hear ubiquitous through stories. And, and, you know, there's a, a common maxim of, of good dads or good parents. And mm. then you get there and you're like, oh no, it's like, it's, it's the sky is blue, the sun is shining, and I would die for that kid. It's just that's that's what happens. It's just it. it, just it is. It's it's just a fact, and there's no it, there's no emotion about it at all. It's just that's yeah. You, I would I would die for that kid. And you you're sitting here telling me the stories like you know we want to be grand, grandfathers. It's like it's never crossed my mind, and I right. my focus. I, 
I'm, follow me on my tangents, man, because they're they're no, they're for sure, for sure. I I just recently started running again. I I, I had fallen off my fitness, and I, I I kicked back up running again, and and um I decided to start with a mile and then add a quarter mile every week, and this was my mile and three quarters, and I ended up just blowing past it and doing two, and then I did two and a half today, and t- today I I ran, and I. I I always feel like I'm running from death. (laughs) And so that's one of the reasons why stoicism is like, well, what if my heart gave out right now? And, and what, what what would I do? Um, But the, the notion of becoming a grandfather and, and um, I, this is why I bring up running is, is I can only see, and and if I start staring too far ahead on my run, like my gaze is Mm. not here, it's here. Because if I look too far down the road, I realize how far I have to go. And then all of the fear of like, will I have the breath? Will I have the strength? Will I have the stamina? God, that's a long way. How long have I been doing this? My feet feel weird. Right. All that, all the noise starts filling up. But if I look just a little bit down, then I go, oh, that's all. I just have to get there. I just have to get 10 feet in front of me. And so I don't know if it's a lack of... of um foresight and and just my visibility of my life is 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 such that i can't see myself becoming a grandfather or i'm what i what i resonates more with me is like if i can make it to when he's 20 i think i can tell him everything that i need to tell him right maybe maybe 21 maybe 25 and i i've i think that that will never i think there's always something because hopefully i'm still learning and so there's stuff that i'm always going to want to impart to him yeah um but what I hear from you, the whole the whole reason why I say that is, I hope you take this as a compliment. I feel like you've already immortalized him. And more than any statue erected in his honor in the middle of the square could ever do. And as a dad, I wouldn't want that. I don't want a plaque. There's a beautiful uh, cemetery right outside of, of um, Dublin, a place called uh, uh, Kilkenny. And it's where they make Smithics, by the way. It's a great beer. Um, but there's this, there's a cemetery and the, the distance from the church is your status and stature in the community. So the closer you go to the church, the more important, famous and rich you were. And so I look at these huge stones that stand just outside of the church, the most prominent, wealthy, affluent, influential people. And they've been there for so long and have suffered the winds of time and weather and war and every bit of circumstances that has befallen that little hamlet of a village. And you can barely tell that they're gravestones anymore. And what we put on our gravestones is our name big. When yeah. we were born, when we died, yeah. and the dash between represents the life. And all they could put on there is, this is why this person was important. And it's their most important. You, you put their biggest thing. This guy had the cock the size of a meat, just whatever it was. He saved the entire village from ghosts, whatever it was. You put that yeah. on the tombstone. And time has just gently wiped their hand over that. And all that's remaining is the stone that it was carved from. So that's not immortal. That is the epitome of temporal yeah but what you are saying is like dad what i'm going to do is i'm going to when i think about my taxes i go to my dad what did my dad tell me about taxes how do i save money (laughs) i'm here to tell you as a dad man that is immortal that is that is so far beyond what any gravestone statue plaque gold brick in the street could be is that at 28, you could go, I think he said to do this on my taxes. Like, <laughs> yeah, I did it. Man, I love plumbing the depths of shit. It's like, we could talk about acting and, and what do you do there? What is your process? But <laughs> do, 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 you, do you prefer like Abu Bakar Salim? What, what, do you, what, what do people call you? What are your friends? I want to be your friend. What do I call I you? I mean, yeah, call me Abu, man. Abu. Call me a boo, bro. Like, that's it. That's 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 how it is. I mean, like, if you could call me a boo, I'd be. Could you just call me a boo quick? I can call you a boo. Just call. Abu, my oh my god! 
you and I will see many adventures, my friend. <laughs> oh, what, for sure. What, tell, can you talk about your studio? I know that a lot of times, this is left turn. Mm. Um, you, you, so you start this studio and you like physically started this thing too, right? It's, it's not just like yeah. you went out and, and got a name. You like, what is the name of the studio? Uh, Silver Rain Games. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know, right? Silver Rain Games. Yeah, man. It drives me crazy because yeah. I hate coming up with names for things. And then people come up, like, I remember I was trying to name a band and then Chris Cornell comes out with Audio Slave and I was like, that's, <laughs> that's really good actually I um, like that. radio head yeah. i could have thought of that um <laughs> so you obviously have a love for story mm. and you want to make that's what drew you into into games what kind mm. of games do you want to make like when you think wow. i was like give me an analog like if i could make a game like x what would that be okay if i could make a game like Okay, if I could bring, let's say, let's say, The Legend of Zelda. Dope. Uh, and then I bring. Like NES flavor. or Breath of the Wild? Like where? where let's, say, you... let's say Breath of the Wild. Let's actually not say Ocarina of Time. Okay. Because that right. was really pivotal for me. So okay. let's say Ocarina of Time. Let's say if I take that and then I'm going to add uh, a splash of, let's say, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Dope. Ori in the Blind Forest. But then let me throw Black Panther at it. From a standpoint of the big marvel cinematic universe or the notion of like what what aspect because i don't want to just here's the problem that i think a lot of people do is they mm. go let's paint it with the brush look how diverse we are see we have a person of color nah, <laughs> fuck that. Art, nah, nah, nah. so evolved it's like that's yeah. that's the most racist thing you're gonna do that's the that's the most bullshit thing you could ever do exactly yeah. so when you say black panther what is it about black panther let me bring you into a world in which you have never seen before, never probably thought before, and fall in love with it. Fuck yeah, dude. Because that's that to me is what is that to me is exciting. Let me let me actually tell you a story about something which you probably wouldn't you wouldn't naturally have access to, right? You you wouldn't naturally think about or want to dive into. Let me bring that to you and let me present you something which we can all relate to and all connect to on a human level. Let me bring out your human truth. But let me show you how cool as fuck this place is. That, that's the kind of stories that I want to tell. The thing that I love about Black Panther, just... It, there's so much about... I mean, the performances are just... Um, mm. It was one of the most captivating and original. Like, I, I hadn't felt that way. Even with Iron Man and everything else, I was kind of like, I've seen this, but it was just... I mean, woof! I mean, it's, I mean, the thing is, what is so powerful about it was it it, it felt relate, it felt human and relatable, right? You've got this yeah. African prince, this kind of Wakandan prince king, and then you've got someone who is a king in his, you know, in in his heart, but like he's been brought up in like the like the hardest parts of America, and it's like you've got, and it's like you know, two two black forces, like going at it, and it doesn't even matter the fact that they're black. You know, Not it's about all. the fact that it, the fact of where they come from or where they were or what they've been or what they've experienced. And they're both kings in their own right, but they are very much it's it, it was just to me, it was just something that was. Again, maybe because of the fact that it felt like, oh, wow, you know, I've you know, I, I recognize this cloth or like, you know, my, I've seen this before with family and stuff or whatever. But there was just something so human about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not Tony Stark. I can't like I don't have stupid amounts of money and then replace my heart with something that makes me like, you know, fly away. Like, I can't do that. Like, I, I can't turn green like mm -hmm. like this. That ain't happening, you know. And whereas you, I look at something like Black Panther and it just felt so weirdly relatable and it was just like really like it was just it was just a story about these you know again it, it felt weirdly shakespearean in a way in the no 100 it it's hamlet man it is it like, is completely 100 
And the thing that I love is, to me, one of the most fascinating things about it is Wakanda and the experiment and the, and the example of what happens in a world that is protected and lives in a bubble outside of the calamity and right. what can happen when the, the, the progress that can be made when they just go, I refuse to participate in this game. And we're just going to yeah. do this. I was like, fuck. You, you're, you're sitting, I know you're in South Africa. Um, mm. And behind you, I, I keep falling in love with this picture of that. The Balbo I mean, tree. Yeah. I've, Isn't I've it crazy? South Africa so once. Did, you, did you know something? Go, please. Let me, let me tell you this, man. Let me tell you this. So Baobab trees. Um, so, so my, my, not my uncle. Yeah, my uncle too, actually. My grandfather was a, was a shaman, was a witch doctor. And he, he believed that um, when you would, you would enter into the tree and, and you'd sleep in it and you'd be able to contact the ancestors and the spirits and actually be able to uh, communicate with, with, you know, the spirits and the ancestors of, of, of the land. And I remember my uncle uh, telling me these stories of my, you know, of his father going, you know, off to these, you know, to, to Baobab trees specifically and, you know, all the crazy things that he saw and, and all this and all this sort of magic and sort of spirituality. But he said the one thing that he always felt whenever he went to a tree or saw these trees or is the safety that comes from it. This, the, the, the security and the safety of a tree. Of, of a baobab tree as well and there's and it's they're believed to be portals to different realms um hence why they are you know, like you know these upside down trees and there's always like a little cavern bit that you can always sit into but yeah sorry man i i completely um no that's the shit that i there. love there's actually I, I want to there's two questions that i have as a follow-up number one so this is your temporary home while you're on set shooting did you mm. bring that or was that just when well, you walked into your because a lot of times these are provides like hey here's your hotel room here's your apartment where we're going to put you mm. up in and by the way here's a tree or do you like no no wherever i go i bring this picture of a tree to remind me no i, I wish it was as magical as that but i well, but i remember coming they showed me the rooms and stuff they showed me a few a few spaces like a few little like temporary like apartments and stuff but i do remember them coming into this room and and, and seeing that in the background and being like I'll, I'll, I'll this one. <laughs> I'll the other one has a view. It's like, I want please. the tree. <laughs> Give me the tree. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah like, forget the sea. I want this. <laughs> well, here, okay, so, yeah. so here's a question I have. Um, growing up, I don't know what your what your upbringing was. You had this very mystical uncle or grandfather. Um, and, and here you're, you're dealing with a show that really wrestles with a lot of things, not only talk about parenting um, and death, uh, but also mm. the, the very outspoken blatant um religion versus atheism and 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 not just like right. with a god without a god but it is christianity really feels like has evolved into this worship of the god's soul um and on the other end of it there was a it felt felt like a war between believers and non-believers or the secular and the mm. christian whatever um it's like the vatican just just erupted um, but then also out of that became this, this atheism and it's, it's more tribal than it, than it ever, mm. ever feels like it was. What, what is that? That, that's a huge conversation. I love having that conversation because growing up in the church and, and now as a, as a, as an adult and being able to go, these are my views and my beliefs mm. because they're all beliefs. Um, what, how do you wrestle with that? How, where do you sit with that? Is that a is that a whimsical, lovely story that your grandfather told you, or is there parts like, no man, I really believe that that's true, or there's something like, what does your worldview look like in the terms yeah, of spirituality? It's it's funny. So my my dad wasn't like he was. So I was brought up Muslim. So like you know, my dad was he was a uh, he. It's funny. My mom wasn't really that religious. Uh, my dad was brought up very religious. And then my mom had a heart attack and then she survived and she was like, I'm, you know, I'm very God, religious God, now. <laughs> God, God exists. Like he is, he's strong. And then, but my dad was, you know, he was brought up like learning the Quran and all this sort of stuff, but he kind of was just like, he wasn't, he didn't really, you know, in it. he's, he's like, huh? Eh. He, I, there's a brilliant story that he told me. He was like, he came, he came to England. Um, Cause they're both, they're both um, from Kenya and he came to England and he remembers watching, uh, like something on the uh, geographic uh, channel uh, where he saw uh, a lion eating 
a deer. And it was at that specific moment he realized that God, God surely, if he surely should be protecting the deer, why isn't God? I can't believe this. <laughs> he completely like was like, nope, this isn't this isn't my thing. But the idea is that you know he was always a man of like you know, he, he was very again. I say he wasn't that religious, but the idea is that I had this. I was brought up very Muslim. Went to like you know. Uh, uh, madrasa, which is very much like a place where you learn how to read the Quran. You learn how to read it in Arabic. You don't know what you're saying, um, but you end up learning how to read the Quran. You learn, you know, you learn, you know, some teachings. But I think one of the big things that really made me not necessarily it wasn't about questioning faith. I think it evolved me in a way because I think I'm looking at my father again, and it comes back to my father. I'm looking at my father at his deathbed, dying, and I'm thinking to myself all the rules tell me that he shouldn't go to heaven or he shouldn't be in peace. But I know this man and I know what he's done and he deserves more peace than anyone that I can ever know. So to, to be have the mentality of like, he doesn't deserve to pass on peacefully because mm -hmm. of the fact that he didn't pray five times a day or that he, you know, had a nice, had a beer every night. Like that doesn't sit well with me. And for me, it's like, I know for a fact, this guy, like he is, he's, he's probably, he's, he's Jay chilling in wherever place he is right now. And he's having a good time looking down on me or probably not even probably having his own, you know, own party in, 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 in heaven or wherever it is. Right. I just know that his soul is at rest and I'm comfortable with that. And I think that's where I'm, you know, where I sit with it. But the thing is, it's like, I think having been brought up in, in a way and then seeing a different, you know, seeing different sides with this show. And that's what I think is really done really beautifully about the show that even though there is this battle, there's no right or wrong, you know, wrong team, right? One, you know, and if you want to say the atheists are right, literally mother just went into a ship. I mean, this is in the first episode, right? And massacred people. <laughs> everybody <laughs> like like literally butchered and like an atheist pacifist as she says you've also got the mithraic though who are you know who are trying to you know bring peace or whatever life that they want to bring but it's it's like it's it's just it's what what i think is great about the show and another thing that's brilliant about it is that aaron presents to you two two sides and he's like here's this way and here's that way watch him and you as the audience can come up. i'm not going to give you the answers you you think about it do you know what i mean there's definitely i feel it shows rather than showing the the positives of both it shows the negatives yes the, the negative connotations the atheists are um nihilists and and even and i've known a lot of atheists that are this way too they're more devout atheists then yeah, the most, then, most christian you're like you're really hardcore about this is like i'm like open uh, you're, you're like no no <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> angry about it yeah so yeah. like mother is represents that she was like we are atheists we are non-believers we don't believe any of that stop praying don't do that give me your medallions you don't need any of that i'm going to melt it down all of that campion to me is the one who's going all right you're both right and you're both wrong yeah right now when I, I, I want to believe that I can make food so I don't have to kill that thing, I'm going to pray. And I need you to be cool with that. But I'm also not going to just be like this other dude who just says, well, well all of soul just wants this to happen to you. And that's why this is happening. Like, well, that's bullshit too. So it's this cool, as Camping kind of represents, he's not an earthling, right? He's, he's this... He's a Kepler. I, I love the fact, by the way, it's Kepler 22B. When, when that came up, I was like, oh my goodness. And Pam was like, what are you, what are you talking about? I was like, well, we believe that Kepler 22B is actually the nearest to uh, an Earth. Uh, so stupid. So I was like, man, this is badass. But the Mithraic definitely have that. They got that Vatican vibe. They're carrying the dude. They got the robes. They speak in very scriptural prose. It's all of mm. that. And it's it's very, you don't know that. If you don't know that, you're not one of us. If you're not one of us, you're one of our enemies. We'll kill you. So it's, but there's not, I haven't seen so far. There's a few characters that have kind of been like, God is love. And, and, and have felt that. But 
it's it's a it's not a vilifying but it, it definitely is a like both sides are bullshit both sides have their yeah. problem a friend of mine who is he would consider himself uh, a, a, in a very whimsical way in a very he would say it with a laugh and a, and a sip of bourbon that he's an he's an atheist um presented something to me that i really love and it's maybe this will mean something to you he said that there is physics supports the notion of eternity and the reason why is because every the, the the particles of light that reflected off of our skin and were caught in your eye are forever changed so when you looked oh, wow. at your dad he is matter can neither be created nor destroyed so he is eternal every proton electron and neutron that he ever came in contact with still exists in the universe and was sent out forever changed just by having impact with him and i was like holy shit and then what happens That's to deep. our body it's super deep and it's like the most beautiful notion of like yeah of course there's eternity it doesn't have to be a mansion with golden streets with a crystal river singing with you know winged angels nor does it have to be the opposite of that or a different version of that there doesn't have to be these you and i as, as storytellers love the dramatic and we love the metaphor but the beauty of it is again I, I bring it down to what your performance was was it's the distillation of all of that and the realization of yes we're on a foreign world yes there are these two warring factions yes this is sci-fi yes i'm wearing this ridiculous latex suit that you look stunning in by the way but i gotta i gotta Thank that's, you. that's 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 not an easy you're like i can't wait to do the role i'm not wearing that <laughs> i've been in that situation before he's like can we do anything is there maybe a thing that we can just have like, here like no, no 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 like what about that that go back to black panthers like that chest plate it's like, <laughs> it's like give me some of that shit. you're like it's you it's you with a little unitard you get all of that and then you distill it down to a single line of truth that the actor realized and camera just happened to capture it and kudos to you man i i am just thank you i'm blown away i'm blown away by you i i i always love i knew that this would be the case because a lot of times it's like don't talk to that person because they're a great actor but they're an asshole <laughs> you know <laughs> And I've, I've, I don't know what your interaction with other people have been. Um, but by and large, I, I've found that, that good actors, good storytellers are, are people of your ilk that just are like, man, I, this caught me and it impassioned me and it spun me off into this path. And I'm, I'm just, I'm chasing that high of a nine-year-old who received a mega drive and realized this could be how. I could tell my story. Yeah. yeah, man. Thank you, man. It really, it means a lot. Like it really does. It really, really does. Good. Because yeah. it just, it's one of those, again, as you know, it's one of those things where you, you do, you just try and tell your truth. And, and I, I know I, 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 that's, that's what drives me, man. Like, I think the time where it does come about like, oh yeah, no, this would be a great job to do if I just, if, if you know it pays the, it pays the bills but it's not really doing anything it's not really moving people it's not communicating with people i think that's the time where it's just like maybe you need to really rethink because again it's 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 about being truthful and it's about being and it's about trying to move and, and move people to a, to a degree and and try and shift their perspective to, you know in, in some way shape or form or even just touch someone in regards to like emotionally i think you know it's 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 great hearing how much you, you know, you again, like hearing you talk about your child, like obviously there is a layer of this performance and a layer of the writing, which has touched you mm -hmm. and, you know, made you reach out to me and want to talk about this. And, and I'm just blessed to be talking to fucking Troy Baker. But the thing <laughs> is, it's like, it's just, but like, the, you know what I mean? But like, it's, it's one of those things where like, I, I know I'm doing the right thing. And I think that, just hearing that is just it's just it's just such an affirmation and, and like confidence boost man like really so thank you thank you man it is my pleasure i my ku my kung fu if i have any is i love being an exhorter and an encourager and if there's 
Look, I mean, South Africa is a beautiful country, but it is <laughs> the reason why it is the cradle of life is because there's every possible factor that is working against life there. But at the same time, it's nurturing. It, it is a good parent. It is hard and it is brutal, but it is fertile and it is, it's, it's everything. And if, if there's ever a day when you're out on set and it's a hard scene, it's a long day, it's a, there's a lot of turnarounds, there's a lot of setups, or there's just a scene that you're still trying to break. I, I hope that those words of like, like you said, this, this show is reaching a lot of people. It was turned on to me by, by Travis and Lauren, like, you've got to watch this show. And I finally was like, okay. And I watched it. It's the moments. It's not the show. It's the moments that the show provides that have sustained me and compelled me. So what you guys are doing, what you're doing specifically, man, is captivating and is definitely worth it. So if those words, if nothing else, can help you on a long day, then I will do my job. Thank you so much. Like, really, thank you, man. Now we got to make a game together. <laughs> oh, don't even. Oh, don't even. What sucks is I, I already know what you'd look like in a mocap suit, and that's just in, that's, uh, that's intimidating. <laughs>